Hey friends, welcome back to Practical Bible Living, where we are studying the gospel according to John. Uh, we are starting today chapter 11, chapter 11. Hard to believe we're already at chapter 11. It's been quite a journey so far, and uh, I'm just con- just very excited to keep going on here. So a um, little bit of a thunderstorm going on outside, so hopefully uh, won't have a power outage, won't... Uh, have thunder uh, jumping in and interfering with our <laughs> our discussion today. It's happened before, and that's why I'm uh, finding it a little bit humorous. But we're going to jump here and uh, look at chapter 11. Now, uh, previously, okay, we wrapped up chapter 10, and we saw something very important. We saw this transition that was happening. The Lord Jesus, who had essentially started his public ministry, which had been initiated by his baptism by John in the Jordan River, we were prompted that now Jesus had returned back to the Jordan where John had first baptized. So, after all that time during his ministry, now he returns to where it all started. And we agreed that this seemed to be an important marker, okay, an important marker on his schedule, his divine schedule. And because even the many people who followed him there to the Jordan, you know, because of the scenery and the location, they remembered all that John the Baptist had said in this very place regarding Jesus. And they concluded that everything he said was true. And we were told that at that time, in that place at the Jordan, because they remembered the testimony of John and making the connection with all that they experienced through Jesus that they believed. We know also that by this time, there's only a short time left before the Lord has given up, right? Uh, his time was now around the corner for him to fulfill prophecy, the prophecy of him being the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Note that this is exactly what John himself said to them. Remember that? He said to them that this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And um, the people here are likely remembering, right? They're remembering all that John said, and they remember that he said this as well. So none of this which was written here is a coincidence, okay? Let's narrow in on this further, okay? We are being reminded in this place, okay, where it all started, okay, and we're being reminded of John the Baptist, okay? John said of Jesus that he was the Lamb of God. He said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Now, all the Jews understand what is meant by a lamb, whose purpose is to be sacrificed because of sin. Okay, Because that's one huge foundation in their law throughout history. They had to offer, uh, they had to offer up perfect, unblemished animals, okay? that perfect, unblemished lamb, to be sacrificed. And that this shedding of blood was necessary because of their sin. You see? So, as we are being reminded of the Jordan... John the Baptist and his testimony of Jesus about Jesus being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, then we see that there is a shift here where the focus is now on Jesus as being that perfect Lamb who's come down, sent from heaven to be the perfect sacrifice. See, we're being shown this transition where the focus is now on the sacrifice. Okay. Again, in other words, we can say it is time to start focusing on the suffering and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which was now at hand. You see, it was now just around the corner. And so you see how we are feeling this transition as the Lord returns to the Jordan where it all started. It's because things are, in fact, changing and the focus is changing. He'll still do some miracles here and there, but his focus, as we said before, is now going to be on the subject of resurrection and life. 
And it's going to be a time for him to focus on his disciples and those who've been following him and have cared for him and have been like close family to him. Right? Whereas he will still be in the public eye, he is now shifting to spend more time speaking and strengthening those in his inner circle. You know, much like when a person today finds out that they have a terminal illness. That person begins getting their house in order, right? That's a phrase we're familiar with. Settling things around them, preparing the hearts of those around them, and with it comes preparing their own hearts, right? Often it's a time of intense prayer, which is in fact the case, as we'll see later. It's a time that's mixed with anxiety and distress, but also a sense of urgency and preparations. And in it all, the Lord is sure to give comfort to all who are around him, though he himself is not totally comforted, and we'll see that. And he's filled with quite a bit of sorrow. Okay? And so we're seeing this purposeful transition to chapter 11. Okay, it's a purposeful transition that we read about to chapter 11 here. It makes sense that it begins with the events surrounding the resurrection of Lazarus that we're going to read about now. Okay, it makes sense that chapter 11 begins with the events surrounding the death and resurrection of Lazarus, who is the brother of Mary and Martha, whom he loves, right? Again, a shift toward those whom he loves who have been with him and are a part of his inner circle. You know, it reminds me when it reminds me when the Lord was preaching in the town to town and he came to a town and they said of him, how does he speak with this authority? Who is he? Don't we know who he is? Isn't this his mother and those his, um, his siblings, his brothers and his sisters? And then, you know, there came a time where the Lord uh, responded to them when they said to him, hey, your family's outside. He said to them, who is my mother and my brothers and my sisters? Those who listen and follow the will of God, who do the work of God, who hear his voice, they are the mother and the brothers and the sisters of the Lord, right? And so we see this shift here, I mean, it's, I'm reminded of that because we're seeing this shift where the Lord now is focusing on those who have followed him, those who have looked to his works, believed, and they also desire to do the will of God. So this shift towards him looking and teaching this inner circle, those who he loves, and also... You know, that doesn't mean that he does We know that the Lord loves everyone, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever shall believe in him shall inherit eternal life and not perish, right? We know that. But there are those who love him back, okay? And we say that relationship, that two-way relationship, and there's a focus on this. Now also, as we noted this increasing focus on Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and thus his own death and resurrection, immediately the next thing that's emphasized in this gospel, okay, after the Lord makes this transitionary move to the Jordan, now we are seeing this great miracle of resurrection. And that's on purpose. Because like we said, there at the Jordan where he was just standing, right, and everyone was remembering what John said of him, that he is the Lamb of God. Right, and that he is the sacrifice. Okay, and it had to do with death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So immediately after that, I'm being repetitive for a reason. We want to be clear. Immediately after that, we're seeing a great miracle of resurrection, of death and resurrection, because all of it's tied together. Okay. There's so much within all of this, right? There's so much within it all that um, we just have to pay attention very closely. All right, we're seeing a lot of stuff here. And yet it's, it really is easy to skim over all of this and just completely miss the understanding and this experience. And so we take the time to meditate on these things so that we're truly walking with Jesus through the gospel and feeling the emotions of those who are present, right? And 
becoming aware of the Lord's purpose and his intentions and even the weight and the heaviness of each day that passes, that presses down on his shoulders and in his heart. We're walking with him. We're experiencing with him. That's what this Bible study is. Well, let's, st- let's start our study here in chapter 11, and let's look at the first two verses. Let's look at the first two verses. We'll start, we'll just jump at verse 1 first. We read the following. Now, a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. Now, we are seeing these siblings who live in Bethany, okay, a family who Jesus loves and knows well. And this is in perfect order here because, as we have spent time establishing, Jesus is shifting towards spending more time with those who are close to him and teaching them important things in these final days leading up to his death. You see, this is a place okay, where he spent time when he retreated from teaching publicly to large crowds in Jerusalem. Okay? They live in Bethany, which is east of Jerusalem, in the direction of the Mount of Olives. And that makes sense because, we, as we saw before and we discussed previously, the Lord often went with his disciples to the Mount of Olives. Okay? It's a quiet place to sit with them and teach them. He loved to go there. Okay? And so Bethany is right around that area also. Now, if you're familiar with the gospel, then you're probably familiar with this family, okay, whom we're told a couple of verses down that Jesus loved. He loved them. We can even look at a short passage in Luke chapter 10. Let me pull that up right here. I have it ready. Luke chapter 10, okay, uh, in verse 38. And uh, we can see here um, a little passage that tells us a little bit about Mary and Martha and Lazarus, which gives us this understanding that he did, in fact, visit them. They did, in fact, receive him, and they did, in fact, love him. Let's read this uh, here from Luke chapter 10. Now, it happened as they went that he entered a certain village, right? And, uh, and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her, which of course is spending time sitting by the feet of the Lord, hearing him. Uh, uh, you know, fellowship uh, with him, right? Being in fellowship with him. So we see this encounter with Mary and Martha um, there in Bethany. So we know uh, from looking uh, at the gospel that this isn't a, this is not a random family. This is a family whom he loved, and he would retreat to go back to them. It was like uh, let me pull back here, okay? And so you know. This town of Bethany, especially this home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, was in a way kind of a home away from home. You see? A home away from home. Now, we see the circumstance, right? This is regarding a family whom he loves, who live in an area that he loved to go visit. And now, Lazarus, the brother whom he also loves, is now sick. So, we see a circumstance developing here, right? So we read in verse 2. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. See, it was that Mary who anointed the Lord. Why are we being told this? What is this about? And so we're given this detail for a reason. Firstly, this is a family, like we said, who loves him and honors him, right? Jesus, especially Mary, the sister who anointed his feet with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair. 
So this fact is brought up to indicate, yes, number one, it's that Lazarus, the one whose family honors and adores Jesus. It's that Lazarus who is sick. Okay. Another thing we should note is this. This thing that Mary has done, anointing Jesus with oil, is actually not described until chapter 12. But we are here in chapter 11, right? And so why does John bring it up now? Well, it has to have a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Partly, he wants us to keep in mind as we read, okay? He wants us to keep it in our minds as we move along. But if we hadn't read chapter 12 yet, it might not seem to fit in well, right? Well, the best explanation for this is this, okay? Which I'm sure you'll agree with because, in, see, the, this gospel, this gospel of John that we are studying now and have been studying is meant to be read more than once. In fact, the gospel should be part of our daily lives. I believe that every family should be reading, better yet, studying the Bible each day. Parents, even together with their children. Because yes, it's a blessing to them and their home, but also because it's the basis for our whole life as followers of the Lord. And every day he speaks to us through it, just as his word is alive and spirit. If you haven't already, or if you do read the Bible regularly, although you are reading in a certain uh, place, you might be in a certain, a different place throughout the Bible, I personally truly believe you should still add in at least one chapter of the gospel daily. Okay, it's so important. The peace that comes from it, right? But anyway, to get back to the point here, John, the author of the gospel here, okay, the author of the gospel intends that we are reading it more than once. In fact, you can't even really study it without having read it over and over and over. Okay, It's not like a race. Uh, It's not a book club, right? Or anything like that. It really isn't anything like that. Okay, It's living with the Lord. Okay, It's like one who follows the Lord, living with Him each day. right? It's a way of life. Reading the gospel daily is a way of life. For this reason, we see here that John is reminding the reader that this is the same Mary that did, that did this thing in chapter 12, which he already described, but it's later in the book. You see that? Because it's assumed that you are coming back to read again. John assumes that you're living through the gospel daily just like he is. You understand? So important that we get these things because um, there is purpose in all of this, as we always say repeatedly. Let's jump to verse 3. Therefore, the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Right? Therefore, let me line it up here. Hold on a second. Therefore, verse 3, Therefore, the sisters, that's Mary and Martha, sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he who you love is sick. The sisters sent to Jesus, whom they title as Lord, revealing to us their deep respect for him as their shepherd, and they as his sheep, his flock, who are expecting, get this, who are expecting that the good shepherd come back and take care of the situation and not leave his sheep in this state of distress, right? And they add, he whom you love is sick, increasing this expectation by reminding him of his love toward them, right? And undoubtedly, their love to him as their shepherd also. It's a very interesting thing to think about. The subject here centering around this relationship of love with the Lord. You see, we don't see that often in the gospel. It's very refreshing, actually, considering that most of the time we are reading about how the people interrogate him wherever he goes, 
or that the people who follow him here or there are just seeking miracles and signs and not he himself. But here, out of the little town of Bethany, we see a relationship with Jesus that is openly a loving relationship. And we should also remember that John, the author of this gospel, is all about the understanding of God as love. After all, isn't he the one who wrote in his epistle the famous God is love in 1 John? Let me pull that up. So worth looking at here. Let's just read verse 7 through 12 very quickly here in the first epistle, uh, the epistle of 1 John, right? We read, this is, this is the same John, right? This is the same John who wrote the gospel according to John, who also received the revelation and wrote to us all that he saw and heard in the book Revelation at the end of the Bible. So, in his first epistle, he says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested toward us, that God has sent his only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Right? The sacrifice for our sins, to atone for us. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love has been perfected in us. You see, he talks all about the love of God because, well, John finds that to be very important, and I would say it is. If you remember in our last discussion, um, a day or two ago, we said, isn't it interesting how Jesus Christ, the Son of God, understanding God through God the Son, Jesus Christ, understanding God the Father through God the Son, Jesus Christ, we see the only God in the world who is identified by his love toward us. We can barely see any evidence of a loving God in other uh, false religions. I want to say false organizations even, clubs, clubhouses. But the true God, the God of the world, is a God of love, and he is found in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Very important to see that. And there's a big emphasis on that as we read here uh, in our passage today. Okay, God is love. Now, that's worth, that was worth mentioning here, because when we read verse 3 in our passage today, okay, we're seeing, we're reminded, Therefore the sister said to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. That's going to come up again. So keep that in mind. Now, let's read verse 4. When Jesus heard, when he heard that, okay, when Jesus heard that, he said, what did he hear? You know what he heard? He heard, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. So first of all, first of all, as we're reading here, understand that Jesus, when he hears that, he's remembering and acknowledging his love toward them and that they love him also. Okay, let's go back to reading. Verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. See that? Now we understand, okay, we understand that when he says not unto death, he's not saying that Lazarus will not die, because we know that Lazarus will die. But what he is saying is that there is a purpose for this. 
right? What's that purpose? That purpose is so that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, will be glorified by this event. Even the Father is glorified through Jesus Christ and the works that he does on behalf of the Father. Right? He does the works that the Father sent him to do. And it brings glory to God. So, we can say that again as this is the meaning of this is that the final result of this purposeful illness and even death is not death. See, the final result of this purposeful, this purposeful illness, okay, the final result, and even death, is not death. Death is not the final result. Because all of this is actually for the glory of God. How so? He asked the question, how so? By demonstrating to them, especially those in his inner circle, as we said, that Jesus has all authority over life and death. But we can also see a hint in it. There's a little hint there that if he has authority over life and death, <clears throat> okay, if he has the authority over life and death, then he will also have the power such that he himself rise also from the dead, which is in fact what he teaches his disciples, right? That the Son of Man will be put to death and will rise on the third day. But the bottom line here, Lazarus's sickness is not random and neither will be his death, okay? It is the setup for the great miracle for them to witness it, see? Have we seen something like this before? We sure did. Oh, we sure did. Do you remember the man who was born blind? Wasn't that long ago. It was chapter 9, right? Do you remember what they asked him, what they said to him about the man who was born blind? Let me just pull that up very quickly here. It's all related. Everything's related. Look at this. Remember this? Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. See that? It's all about the works that he is doing because he is the light of the world and he is doing the works that the Father sent him to do. And these works give glory to to God, right? So the Lord said, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, the wor but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Does that seem familiar? That should seem familiar. See it? It's the same here. It's the same here what we see in verse 4 of our passage today, chapter 11. So when Jesus says that it is for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through it. He is meaning that it's so that the works of God should be revealed in him. And therefore, all the people will give glory to God through Jesus Christ, who is God the Son, even giving glory to him because, because of these uh, marvelous works that he's doing. And I would take a moment here and ask this question. It's, it's actually... Um, worth thinking about. Can there be any greater miracle than raising someone from the dead and you know bringing someone back to life? I mean, the same miracle when God created life from the beginning and also the great miracle when God gives us who believe eternal life when that day comes. The miracle of Jesus himself rising from death into life, glorified. There's nothing greater. You see, by, by definition, death is nothing and becomes powerless. When you can restore life, then death has no, no power over you. There's verses about that all over the Bible, but... We'll, we're just going to stick and keep ourselves narrow here for the sake of time. 
Okay, Death becomes void. Death can no longer have any authority over us if we are able to receive life again. Right? Oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? You see, death no longer has authority over us if we are able to receive life again. And yet, eternally, such that we can never die again. Imagine that. That's the promise that the Lord gives us. Isn't that something we should um, not overlook? Isn't that something that should make us, if we don't believe the gospel, should make us think twice, at least? Maybe three times? Maybe a million times we should make us rethink? Nothing can be greater than this, right? And this is why we are seeing this theme of life and death and of resurrection. Okay, it's becoming prominent at this transitional point in the gospel. Now, we know that the Lord, prior to Lazarus here, did already raise people from the dead, right? We've read about that. There are the stories throughout the gospel. But this is the focus now, that this is a great miracle he's doing for those in his inner circle, those people you know, who are his home away from home. And it's bringing our focus now to the Lord being the giver of life and that in him is found resurrection. That's where this is all going. And so let's keep our minds and our hearts open as we continue reading in this passage. So let's go here to verse 5. Now, Jesus loved Martha. See that? and her sister, and Lazarus. Say it again. Now, Jesus loved Martha, and her sister, and Lazarus. Now, we had seen that Mary and Martha sent for Jesus, saying, He whom you love is sick. So we see this confession from them, that they perceive his love for them. And yet, John confirms it to us here, Right? Verse 5, a verse all on its own to assure us that indeed Jesus loved them. Right? It's a confirmation. Remember, John the Beloved, who is the author here, who loves to write about the love of God, right? I mean, it's all purposeful that John wrote here about how Jesus loved them. Firstly, Okay, so that we don't inappropriately begin to think that Jesus didn't care about those who were in this circumstance, as it were for the glory of God. Right? So we don't think, oh, for the sake of the glory of God, uh, the Lord lets people suffer. Um, and we start thinking of the Lord in some kind of bad circumstance, as if, as if he doesn't love us for some reason. No, 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 no. Jesus absolutely loves them. Okay? He loves Lazarus, and he loved the man who was born blind, by the way. He loved him too. It's important to know that. It's important to know that, and that's why there's a lot of emphasis here and confirmations about the Lord's love. Right? It's important to know it. And secondly, it's important to know that Jesus loves them because as we will see, It's so that we don't initially misunderstand the Lord's actions in the coming verses here. What actions? Let's take a look. In verse 6, we read the following. So when he heard that he was sick, that is Lazarus, when he heard that he was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. Hmm? Did you catch that? So when he heard that he was sick, He stayed two more days in the place where he was. Doesn't say he rushed back to quickly rescue him. Says he stayed two more days where he was already. You know, I'm reminded of uh, Jonah, Jonah the prophet. Remember Jonah, the book of Jonah? So, such a nice book, very short book, four chapters, I believe. Go back and read that. So nice. Um, Jonah needed to go to Nineveh. He was told, You have to go to Nineveh. God told him, Go to Nineveh to preach to the people repentance so they would repent from their sins. And the purpose of that was what? So that they may be saved and spared from God's wrath. Right? Being saved is from, from God's wrath is the same as saying being given life. 
right? And not death, right? But instead, what did Jonah do? What did Jonah do? What did he say? He said, oh, I don't think so. I think uh, I'll instead hitch a little ride on a boat over here in Joppa and head way down the sea over there to Tarshish. Opposite direction. You know, Jonah was a type and shadow of Jesus, right? In the gospel. And the Lord said he would give them a great sign. He said he'd give them the sign of the prophet Jonah. This is the Lord Jesus in the gospel at the time of Jesus. He said, I will give them one great sign, the sign of the prophet Jonah, because just as Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days and three nights, he too, the Son of Man, will rise after three days and three nights. So it's an important, uh, you know, it's an instinct to see similarities there uh, when when you consider uh, the book of Jonah, the the prophet Jonah. Um, But, you know, I'm also remind you know you know, I'm also reminded of this when we see how the Lord delayed. Okay, sometimes we might think of someone who's calling the doctor to come because your family member is very sick and needs help, and the doctor decided to go somewhere else for a few days, right? And not just any doctor. Let's say it's a doctor who you knew loved you, and you knew he loved you and your family. You see here. This is why John, our author here, has pointed out a couple times already that Jesus loved them. It was important to establish that. Because as we see, by his response, staying where he was rather than rushing over to Lazarus, Mary and Martha could sit and wonder, oh, maybe he doesn't love us. Why didn't he come to us? So that's why John established this notion of the, that loving relationship between them. And he used it for this wonderful purpose. Let's see. So as we're reading, by the way, we have to suspect something else. When we read something in the gospel and we say, well, why did this happen? Why did this happen? Did the Lord um, just want to torture them for this, uh, you know, to make a point? No. Right? There's some other reason here. So as we're reading, we have to suspect something else and meditate on what's happening. It's important to meditate on, not just uh, to understand the entire picture here, but also because if we don't meditate on it, then when we ourselves, you and I, are put in difficult circumstances in our own lives, we might forget that the Lord loves us. We'll forget it. And we may forget that often things seem like we have been abandoned when actually the Lord has a more marvelous and better way to address our circumstances. And sometimes it's also for the glory of God. You know what it, how wonderful it is to be part of revealing the glory of God? Lazarus taking part in the glory of God and the revealing of the glory of God. I mean, you don't, we don't value that now. But one day we will see the true value in it. Now, in the context of a lot of us in our daily lives, we feel abandoned by the Lord. And you have to first establish, am I even walking with the Lord? Do I even live with Him? Because this won't apply at all unless you're walking with the Lord as His sheep, right? Sometimes as His sheep, as His flock, we say, why am I in this terrible circumstance? I know a lot of us feel that way at many times. A lot of us today feel like that right now. How does Jesus Christ the Lord love me when this and that happened to me or to my family? And it's as if he is not hearing our prayers. You see, well, that's one clear thing we're going to learn together with Mary and Martha as we read along. Isn't that something we're purposely given so that we Learn along with Mary and Martha? Yeah, it is. Sure is. So we're going to jump here to 7 and 8 and read the following. Then, after this, he said to the disciples, Let us go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? So, They had just been in Jerusalem, which is in the area of Judea, where they were attempting to stone Jesus to death, right? 
But he escaped from them and went out toward the Jordan where John the Baptist had been uh, baptizing people several years back. And so his disciples, so his disciples are saying exactly what's on their mind. They're like, um, come again? You want to repeat that? Uh, Rabbi, teacher, do you remember? They were just trying to stone you back there. And actually, that's why we left there, right? And you're saying, you want to go back? See, obviously, they're not thinking the way Jesus is thinking, right? How does the Lord respond to them here? Let's read uh, in verses 9 and 10. Verse 9 and 10, we read, the Lord respond to them. Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble, because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, he describes something to them literally, okay? He describes something to them literally, which he is using as a template to explain to them something spiritually, right? He does that often, doesn't he? We've seen that many times. And many times we've seen people try to understand them literally, such that, for example, Nicodemus saying, How shall a man be born again? Shall he enter his mother's womb a second time? Or the Samaritan woman saying, Where will you get this living water, seeing how you don't have a bucket and the well is deep, not realizing the living water? Uh, is his Holy Spirit and his word, which is spirit, right? And uh, even uh, those who, to whom he said, uh, my flesh is meat indeed, is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And they uh, said to him, how can we eat his flesh and eat and drink his blood? And they didn't know he was talking to them about coming to him and believing in him, which we talked about all throughout that four-part series called Come and Eat, uh, back when we were reading in that chapter. And of course, many times throughout the gospel, we see the Lord uh, saying something to them, and they not understanding uh, what he's spiritually telling them. It's all spiritual, right? A lot of it is spiritual. Now, he does mention lots of things literally, but he makes it clear uh, when he's talking spiritually, because he gives them the understanding, right? It's not like he leaves them not knowing what he said, different from when he's giving parables to people because it's, they don't have ears to hear. That's different. But when the Lord is giving an important teaching and it's meant to be spiritual, he always gives the explanation for it, right? We always get it. He doesn't leave us and abandon us not knowing what he's saying. And we've talked about it, and we've given all that explanations that he's given. So, okay, many, many, uh, many times we've seen that in the gospel. Now, Jesus here is noting the general principle that there are approximately 12 hours where there is daylight, which we know adjusts throughout the seasons. We are aware, but he's saying generally speaking, right? We can catch glimpses of this uh, notion of 12 hours of daylight, uh, by this historic use throughout the gospel even of them referring to, you know, the third hour of the day, the sixth hour, ninth hour, tenth hour, twelfth hour. We've seen lots of examples of that. The third hour, right, and this is all about the, the times of the day where there is daylight, right? The third hour uh, being, for example, 9 a.m., the sixth hour being 12 noon, the ninth hour being 3 p.m., for example. And we've seen um, through the gospel several times and we'll see it again, especially as the Lord is crucified, when the Lord is crucified. Let me show you um, little examples of that. If you look here in uh, Matthew uh, chapter 27, when Jesus is on the cross, we read, Now from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, now we see that uh, this is darkness from the sixth hour to the ninth hour, right? And what's the sixth hour is 
around noon, and the ninth hour is around uh, 3 p.m., right? So we see the, the use of this throughout the Bible. Uh, we could see another use of it. Remember when we studied about the Samaritan woman? And we read that the Lord came, came down uh, to a city called Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, remember? Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, which means it was around noon, right? And that meant that it was, we were to understand that it was during a hot time of the day, right? Where he's walking and he's journeying and he's wearied. It's a very hot time of the day. And even the Samaritan woman here comes out during the hottest time <clears throat> or a very hot time during the day to get water. So we see that understanding. Okay, so that brings us back here to our passage. And whenever someone walks during the day, let's think about it. Whenever someone walks during the day, they don't stumble because the light of the world, for example, that big yellow round sun in the sky, right? Right, that gives light during the daytime. Okay, uh, that, you know, gives you light so you don't stumble. So you can see what you're walking over. Now, you might take that for granted, but remember the context, right? Jesus and his disciples walked on rough terrain, rocky roads, mountains, up and down by the Jordan, to and from the Sea of Galilee, right? You have to remember, that was important. They are seen where they're walking. Many people trip. They don't have cars, right? No electric scooters, right? And stumbling as it got dark became a real thing. People stumbled quite a bit. So people did most of what they could during the daylight hours, right? Now you're probably thinking here, uh, George, certainly he's not talking to them uh, about tripping on rocks for not walking in the sunlight. And you're right. This is the template for his message, right? Now, whether they understood it, we're not totally sure here, but I like to think that they did. And so, let's make sure that we understand it too. And that is this. Jesus is the light of the world, right? John said it, John the author of the gospel, and Jesus himself told us, right? He is the light of the world. And he is doing the work of the Father who sent him. Therefore, he will not stumble because his works are good and they are of God and they are of the light. What do I mean? His works are of the light, meaning referring to the pure and holy domain of God. See? They're in the domain of God. So no matter where he goes, as long as he is walking in this godly domain, which is the light, nothing will happen to him that is not appointed to him. In other words, the Pharisees cannot do anything to him. Okay? They cannot take him and put him to death before the appointed time because he is walking in the light of God, being God the Son. He's doing the work of the Father, giving glory to the Father, walking in the light. You see? So nothing can happen to him that's not appointed to him. And it's not yet the appointed time. Right? But that time is coming. The time that we always speak of, right? Noting that they previously were not able to take him because it had previously not been his time. And we talked about that a lot now. So the Lord will continue teaching the kingdom of God and drawing people to himself as long as there are 12 hours in the day, meaning as long as the Lord is in the world, as long as he is the light of the world, he will continue his mission. Okay. Now, this is also for his disciples too, because when Jesus leaves and ascends to heaven, they are the ones tasked with this work, right? To carry out the work given to them, sharing the gospel with the world. And to do it in the light, they have to walk in the domain of God. They should not fear as long as the light is in them, right? And in this case, when the Lord ascends, they have to have the Holy Spirit in them. 
and they have to be walking in the domain of God, the domain of light. As it says in verse 10 that we just read. See, nothing can happen to them that is not appointed to them. Okay, But remember, he did tell them that they would be persecuted just like he would. He was persecuted. And there would come a time when they too would suffer significant things. Right? <clears throat> Some would even be put to death. But until then, until that appointed time, isn't that the case? Until that appointed time, as long as there are 12 hours in the day, they should walk with confidence in the light of the Holy Spirit and do the works of God. And finally, it's not just for uh, a message about the Lord and what He's doing, and not just a message for His disciples, but it's also a message here for you and I, because after all, John is writing all of this down, recording it for us. Right? So this message, this message rings true, very true for us. Many of us want to serve the Lord one way or another. Okay? And we should not be discouraged or allow ourselves to get lazy. Okay? As long as there are 12 hours in a day, okay? all you watchmen, all you who, who are out there preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, all you who are trying to give glory to God, as long as there are 12 hours in a day, Okay, and I don't. And let's let's make a point here. This theme is not just limited to the, you know, talking about twelve hours a day. We're not just talking about this astrological equinox of perfectly divided day and night. It's a general principle, right? As long as there's daylight, okay, we should walk in the light, having the Holy Spirit staying within God's domain. You might take that for granted. But there is this domain, God's domain. You know, compare that with those who step out of God's domain and walk in the dark, like those referred to throughout the Bible, especially in the epistles, of they're being referred to as the children of the dark, who are compared with the children of the light and children of the day. See, these children of the dark are children who are outside of God's domain and they walk and do works that are evil. When one extends his hand out to do wickedness, okay, when one extends his or her hand to do wickedness, he steps into the domain of darkness and he stumbles. And make no mistake about it, the Lord observes and makes note of who is doing what. Right? The Lord is making notes about who's doing what. And he divides the children of the light from the children of the dark. And that's for a reason. And it will come very soon where the children of the dark will be given into the dark days of judgment and tribulation. While the children of the light will be given into the light where there is joy and everlasting life. But, we can say that the Lord's message here is clear and nothing will stop the work of God that is being said. Okay? Nothing will stop the work of God. And we too, you and I, will continue to share the gospel and show others that there is this light. Until the next one, have a blessed weekend.